morning and assalamu alaikum so i'm not speaking so yesterday i was here and i was on the stage and i was speaking to you a bit about the media um today i'm not speaking about the media i'm speaking with a different hat on because i'm also a board member of the mozilla foundation and we've just released the inter internet health report for 2019 Um, and it's just come out, so I thought it's a great opportunity to share some of the findings we've had in the report. And we're posing the question in this report of how healthy is the internet? And what we mean by this is really we're asking a set of questions. And we're asking, is it safe? How open is it? Who is welcome? Who can succeed? And who controls it? And these questions are really pivotal because the internet has become the place where we live it's a place where we transact online it's a place where we socialize it's become such an integral part of our lives so when we sit and think about how healthy is the internet we're really looking at a complex set of questions there is if you were coming to get an answer of it's healthy it's very healthy it's a little healthy it's quite sick unfortunately we're not going to get that but what we're really going to get is trying to explore some of the complexity and some of the questions that you as young people and that policy makers and that everybody involved as end users of the internet and people who have a stake in it on the panel earlier um one of the panelists was talking about the access to information um and how this is something that's so key for what the youth want so we're really talking about all of those aspects so first what do we mean by internet health and to understand this and answer this question We have to understand that the internet is an ecosystem. It's not one thing you can touch, but it's made up of a number of different parts from the undersea cables that are laid that connect us in the infrastructure layer to the devices that we use that connect us to the internet, to the cloud services, to the business models that allow the internet to function, to the advertising trackers that are sitting in your web browsers, to the apps that you use. and every one of these things plays a part of this ecosystem and it's all interconnected but the internet itself is a global public resource and it belongs to us all equally so it's something that we should all be invested in and all should work hard and fight for to make it better now when we think about the internet and we think about lots of the threats uh, that exist they seem harsh they seem like monumental challenges and that's true the internet is under threat and there's lots of things um working people are working to block the internet in many countries uh there's lots of threats to our privacy to security and so on these threats are really serious because when you think about them you know they really affect our lives in a fundamental way they affect uh, everything that we do on a daily basis the effect how we communicate how we live to the effect it could affect our freedom so we need to think about this deeply and seriously so what exactly is this internet health report we're talking about so it's an open source initiative to document and to explain what's happening to the health of the internet it's compiled um with input of over 200 researchers end users academics and documents put together each year looking at what these key areas are and we're looking at these five areas and you know we're looking at what's the privacy and security what's the state of it what's the state of openness on the internet how is digital inclusion being developed what is the state of web literacy look like and what does decentralization of this internet look like today so i'm going to go through this we only have a few minutes but i'm going to go through some of these issues very quickly touch on some of them with the hope that you'll go on download this report it's all online um access some of these articles um and read a bit more about them so the first question when we talk about privacy and security is we're asking the question is it safe and we've seen last year in 2018 it was a pivotal year for us thinking about privacy and security on the internet when we saw the cambridge analytica scandal come out where millions of users facebook information was accessed illegally um and used eventually to influence elections in the UK in the US you know we stood back and we started taking the issue of pr privacy and security much more seriously on the internet
But that was just one aspect of it. We've also seen time and time again our private information and personal information being breached. Companies have lost this data. Um, hackers have broken into companies. It's not been secured. So looking around all of these issues, there are a number of things that we need to be thinking about. We need to think about how we protect our personal information. We need to be asking questions about what companies are doing with our data when we give it to them. So we really need to understand this issue. And it's only going to get more complex. As we start thinking about our DNA, when we start putting them onto online services to analyze our health, you know, this is really private information that reveals a lot about us, and not only about us, about our families as well. Um, when we think about ransomware and the ability, this has become more widespread where hackers will access your machine, encrypt your data, and force you to pay them in order to get your valuable information back. So all of this has been increasing over time. So the number of issues here which we need to be thinking about, thinking about at every level, from what we can do as the end user, to what we can force our governments to do in terms of legislating it, and to what we can force the companies whose services we're using um, and how they handle our own data. The next point is to talk about openness and ask the question of how open is the internet. And the internet was really built on the premise of being open. And that's how it developed and that's how it exploded. The ability for any one of us to be able to read information and access information and then to write information and to be able to contribute. And of course, you know, when we think about this, we really think about Wikipedia as being the ideal of this, where we've created this global public resource built by each one of us being able to contribute to it um, and to develop it. So how do we think about openness and how do we ensure the openness of the internet, where we all can contribute and the network can develop? Now, of course, there's some serious threats to openness when companies consolidate, when companies control this information and try to close it. But of course, it's not just companies. It's also governments. And governments who are shutting down the internet, um, we're seeing this increasingly. One of the really interesting articles you'll see up is about how you know, governments are changing tactics as well. And where many governments are not shutting down the internet outright, as it was done in Egypt during the Arab Spring, but they're slowing down the internet during protests. So the information can't get out, but they won't get accused of completely shutting down the internet. So as we become smarter to try to root around some of these uh, attacks on the open internet, governments and people who'd like to crush dissent are uh, evolving their strategies as well. So it's important, and of course, we get a new challenge as well when we think about openness, because we want to be able to contribute on the network and to be able to do these things but it also comes with its own set of problems around harassment and hate speech. And sometimes we see an overreaction as well, where people are using hate speech and harassment to try to over-legislate to crush free speech. And we see this with Singapore's new fake news law. So I just wanted to, there was one, there's a really great article in here um, talking that's titled, Show Me My Data and I'll Tell You Who I Am. Um, and it really explains, you know, we talk about data and big data and what it means to all of us. But if you go in and read this article, it's got this great framework. And I thought I'd share this with you just to give you a taste of uh, some of the things that are in the report. And what it looks like, what it tries to give you is a framework for how our data is being put on the internet. And the first part is what you share. So every day you're doing things, some of you are taking photos, you're tagging them, you're uploading them, you're posting to Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat. Um, and there's things that you're contributing willingly onto the network. Your username, your real name, your gender, uh, maybe your location, your friends, people you don't like who you've blocked, um, the things you search for, the photos you've uploaded. And these are sort of the first layer, if you think about this. And this is things that who you are, and you've publicly made this available. And the next layer then is your behavior, and what your behavior tells the internet companies and everybody who's tracking you online. And these are things like the websites you've visited and the keystrokes you've used, even the things when you misspell something or mistype something is being recorded. Um, and that will tell these companies something about you. Um, the things that you've ignored, the things that you've liked, the time you use the internet, how long you've sat on certain websites, the shopping you've done, how quickly you type. And this is all data you're perpetually generating just by your behavior. And then the third part is really what the machine thinks about you. 
and what the machines and the internet and these algorithms would take in these first two sets of data and infer things about you. And this is the layer where you have no control over. Because you have no over control over what the machine is thinking about you. You can't go and change it and say, I think that's wrong. Because the machine will tag you and say, well, this is your ethnicity. This is your religion. Uh, this is your professional relationship. Uh, this is a psychometric profile about you. Um, do you have high self-esteem or low self-esteem? This is your IQ that will be given to you based on your activity. Um, do you have a mental illness? Do you have a gambling problem? So these are all things that go into this black box where you have no control over it. Um, you all remember the famous case where there was a lady who was pregnant, um, and before she told anybody in her family, she was already getting messages from an online retailer offering her baby clothes and napkins and all sorts of things because the machine already knew that she was pregnant before she could tell anyone, just by her browsing habits. So it's important that we think about all these things and think about how our data works. Um, the next issue is digital inclusion and who is welcome online. So it's not just enough to get connected. 2018 was a landmark year. More than 50% of the world's population went online last year. But when it's people coming online, it's just not them connecting, but it's also how welcome do they feel. Do people of minorities, people in poorer countries, do they feel that they have access to this network in the same way that others? What do we think about bias as machines are making more decisions? Are we building in the same bias that we had today into the algorithms that are making decisions about us? Um, you know, more than half the world's population is online, but there's still a deficit in terms of accessing this network. If you look at speed versus cost, in the places where you have the slowest internet, you've got the highest cost. You know, in Africa is the most extreme example of this. So these are still challenges that we need to work on. How do we bring people online in a way where we can include them uh, in this? Um, this is a great graphic, just thinking about what the world looks like and who's online and who's not online. And you'll see in Asia and Pacific, um, in Africa, there's still many people to come online. And how does this change the complexion of the internet as we know it? Finally, um, we talk about web literacy. Because once you're online, are you, what can you do online? And this is a huge issue. You know, in Myanmar, we faced a problem over the last few years where people came online, but they were coming online not to the open internet as we know it, but really they were coming online to Facebook. And for them, Facebook was the internet. You know, and the, knowing what the internet is is quite important and how we use it, how we discern what information is true and accurate and what's not. Um, you know, there's this joke that we used to say, I read it online, so it must be true. You know, um, and of course it's not. And we need to be able to give people the tools and the skills to be able to deal with going online um, in a way where they can judge material, they can see which websites they can trust and which they can't. Uh, also, how we deal with harassment online, you know, and good behavior, and what's it, what does it mean to be a good citizen online? Um, so there's a number of things thinking about this, um, understanding surveillance, understanding the threat to democracy and the challenge we have with elections. We've seen this in many countries um, where during election campaigns there's been huge misinformation campaigns, coordinated campaigns run, there have been campaigns of hate run online. Finally, and the last part, and this is really the part that ties everything together, because it's who controls the internet and how do we work for a more decentralized internet. Because really, when we start digging a bit, and when you start reading a bit, you'll see that there's really eight companies that control the majority of the infrastructure and the majority of the business that happens online. Um, and these companies, you know, there are three Chinese companies, Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent, and, six, um, and <clears throat> five American companies, Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft. And the majority of infrastructure of business, of revenue that's getting driven, are driven by these eight companies. So what does this mean when we think about the internet and whether, how it will evolve going into the future? So there's a number of issues that we need to be thinking about. There's a great article in here looking at the business models of these companies. Because often we don't think enough about how the internet's running and what's going on. We're happy to say we'll use these apps, we'll, they're all for free, or we're paying a bit of money, and we do all this stuff online, not realizing why it's free and why it's happening. So to go and understand 
why Facebook operates the way it operates, why Google operates the way it operates, is really important and will empower you to make better decisions as well. Um, so finally, why does Mozilla care about this and why should you care about it? And the answer is really simple. Because online life is the real life. There's no, you know, 10 years ago and 20 years ago, we used to talk about this thing called new media and talk about the internet as something separate from ourselves. Something that we do and you'd go and you'd uh, put your modem on and you'd connect online, you'd do something and you disconnect. Today there is no disconnection. From when you wake up to when you go to sleep, everything you're doing is online. And in fact, even while you're sleeping, you know, while I'm sleeping, my watch is tracking my sleep. So when I wake up, it tells me I got seven and a half hours of sleep and I woke up in a good state. So everything that we're doing is perpetually connected online 24 hours a day. So this is our real life. So we need to be really involved in affecting it. Um, the good news is we can make the internet better. And as you go through this report and you read it, you'll see that the artists, technologists, young people, policy makers, were all working to influence and change the direction of the internet to make sure that those original values and ideals of openness still exist. So what can you do? Um, very quickly, please go and read, download, share this report. Um, consider what if the internet's healthy where you are. You know, the report's an open source process when we compile it. We're going to be compiling the one for next year as well. Um, and we'd love for all of you from all the countries that you come from to be able to get your input into this, to talk about what's going on in the internet in your own regions. Um, when websites get blocked in your country, when Wikipedia gets shut down in your country, you know, when these things start happening, these are important issues to be able to raise and to share with others. Discuss it, engage with research, and contribute to this next report. Um, if you just Google Internet Health Report 2019, it will come up. There's the short link. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope to speak to you some soon. <laughs>